tonight is the uh, gentleman who inspired the movie The Right, and that's the uh, movie that had Anthony Hopkins in it. The young priest going through priesthood and then being trained as an exorcist. A lot of people seen the movie and read the book. And we're going to talk shop. Of- Hello, Father Gary? That's me. I had a terrible traffic jam getting home from my mom's house, so it took oh me more than goodness. almost an hour and a half to get home. So I'm oh. here, and uh, my the uh, the uh, somebody from your staff was was on the line telling me what number yes. to call, so I had to wait to get off until I could make a call. Oh, good, Father Gary. Yes, 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 yes. So we welcome, we understand. Father. Thank yes, you. welcome, welcome, welcome. I just want to tell you it's a real <laughs> treat. We love watching your videos. We love reading your book. We enjoyed the movie made after your life. We love watching where you take your ministry right into the bars, right to the college kids. It's like you get your point and you drive it home. It's like you're entertaining, okay? Oh, well, thank you. I'm not, I'm not meant to be, but thank you for, I guess <laughs> that's a compliment. It is, you know, it is a compliment because, <laughs> Basically, you take something very, very, very scary, and you tell people, look, you don't have to be scared. Just right. be a good kid. Right. Be a good kid. Listen to your mom. Go to right. church. Be a good right. kid, and you're not going to be scared. And this, it, it is that simple. Where, where did you hear that I was in a bar? Well, we watched a couple of your videos. You, had, um, you were in like some t- type of auditorium arena. Type oh, no, thing. I know. I've given talks all over the United States. and can uh, Yes. Newman centers and parishes and things like that. The reason I'm asking about just, bar is just uh, about three weeks ago, I gave a talk at, uh, uh, to an organization called Theology on Tap, and it was in wonderful. a pub in Santa Clara, and there were about 250 people there actually. So wow. I thought I didn't have I didn't know that that was even taped, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you never know with cell phone technology you never you know, know what's exactly. going to be captured everybody's tweeting everything you do father tweeting twittering yeah. facebooking my spacing you're you're just sorry you're a hot topic father wow well yeah. if it'll help educate people then i guess it's a it is a good thing because it it's is all a about thing. educating and and evangelizing and catechizing and and healing uh, and healing, that's what absolutely. Says. That's, what this it's ministry, a healing ministry. that's what this ministry is all about. It's a healing ministry, primarily. Thank that's you, Father. Word. God bless you. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Sure. Very happy to be. Thank you for inviting me on. I'll let my husband take over. I am under his authority, after all. Okay. <laughs> Go for it, Ken. <laughs> on your background, uh, I would like you to fill in the listeners, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, uh, your background... You know, beginning as a priest. Um, but I'd like to ask you, because our son had said something kind of funny one time when we uh, were just seeing how the young people are out there, and it's like, we're just going to do an arranged marriage for the kids so that we can trust it, or they're not going to end up with someone who's no good and divorces them or abuses them. And then my son goes, what if I want to be a priest? Mm-hmm. So <laughs> if I was having a talk with my son. Yeah, that, 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 that probably <laughs> caused you to pause. Yes, yes. I don't want to get I married. Do not arrange a marriage. Being... I want to be a priest. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's definitely. And that's well, like something, you know, I had a conversation with my mother about with myself. So, uh-huh. you know, when you tell your story, sometimes I relay it to the youngsters. And uh, we'd like to hear what brought you into Holy Orders. Well, I think at a very young age, uh, I was very impressionable with the priests in our parish over the course of my growing up years. And I think as a young person, young kid, grade school and junior high kid growing up, I think um, I certainly was drawn to the priesthood then. And then uh, my parents had um, encouraged me to wait, but they were supportive, but, you know, cautious in an appropriate manner. And they said, you know, if you still want to enter the seminary after high school, you know, we would support that. Well, by the time high school ended, um, I really had, I hadn't lost my faith, obviously, but I I kind of, I, I... I, I lost, I really think my vocation went to sleep. It was at a time in the life of the church when there was, a, where it was tremendous upheaval and a lot of, um, just I think a lot of confusion. And so uh, I started working at the mortuary business, actually, which actually is in the movie. And uh, it wasn't my father's or anything like that, but I ended up working for the local funeral home down the street from our parish. And uh, so by the time I ended college, I really had pretty much decided I thought it would enter, this, enter the uh, funeral industry and eventually maybe own wow. own firm, et cetera. 
But a lot, I've been yeah. seeing, uh, dating a young woman uh, pretty seriously after about two, three years. And, um, but then we had a change in our pastor and a deacon who later became a priest came into our parish and I started thinking about the priesthood again. And so at age 25, to try to truncate this a bit, at age 25 I entered the seminary after kind of really about a three-year real discernment. And uh, meanwhile, I woke up with my girlfriend and I just felt I needed the clarity to try and make this decision. And having uh, this woman in my life, I think, was going to confuse matters. So I broke up with her and then just really tried to discern the vocation. So I entered the seminary at St. Patrick's in Menlo Park, which is in the Archdiocese of San Francisco. I entered at age 25 in 1979. And then I was ordained in 1983. And in that, I've been ordained, it'll be 31 years in December, but I've been a parochial vicar in two churches, oh. I've been pastor of two churches, I've been vocation director for a period of six years, uh, chaplain at a Catholic high school for six years, pastor of one church for 12, and I'm in my ninth year where I'm at now, and then of course I'm the exorcist as well. So that's kind of in a nutshell, oh. those are the assignments I've had, and oh. I've tended to stay in places for a long time. That's oh, wonderful. Yeah. How long? How long were you in Rome? Um, I was in Rome for eight months. I was in Rome on my wow. sabbatical. My sabbatical lasted ten, but I really didn't go over to Rome until about six weeks after I started the sabbatical, and then I was there. I was there until the middle of April, just after Easter, and then came home and assumed the pastorate here at Sacred Heart. So, but I was in Rome for eight months, and I worked directly under um, an Italian exorcist in the city of Rome for three and a half months. Um, was he anything like Anthony Hopkins? <laughs> well, actually, he looked even. a little bit like Anthony Hopkins. Um, <laughs> Anthony Hopkins, yeah. in some of his roles, you know, has a beard. And um, yeah. uh, the, the Father Carmen um, looked actually a little bit like Padre Pio. He was a Capuchin monk. Wow. And, uh, but he, he had kind of a bit of a, a bit of a gait and a beard and very nice man. And he was most gracious to accept me as an apprentice and just be there to observe as he did for uh, the months that I had the opportunity to really, you know, serve under him. It's too bad I didn't find him sooner, but it took a while. It, was not, it, it just didn't happen. Uh, I had to go find an exorcist, and that was not the easiest thing to do in a foreign country where Italian is not my first language, and um, trying to track down who an exorcist is and then, at, and then persuade him to... Um, you know, accept me as a candidate and let me observe. That was not an easy thing. It took, it took about um, about a month to nail it all down. Oh my goodness! Hmm. Yeah, a lot of times there's this notion, and it even goes back to the movie The Exorcist, that the exorcist is just unscathed. Let me give you an example. Linda Blair throws pea soup up on um, the uh, elderly priest and. He just wipes his glasses off as though, you know, a little speck got in his eye and then, you know, continues on and doesn't. And that's what you're supposed to do. Was this mentor priest pretty much like another day at the office, feed the cats, you know, free a girl from possession? Um, yes. Did yes, you so find it kind of? Yes. In fact, uh, uh-huh. the way that Anthony Hopkins portrayed Carmen was actually fairly accurate. I mean, there's a point in the movie during uh, one of the exorcism scenes with the, the young woman who's impregnated and also possessed when the phone rings and he goes to answer the phone and says, pronto. That is very, that was very, um, absolutely uh, accurate. Uh, in fact, uh, wow. there were a number of times in the middle of an exorcism, the phone would ring and, and Father Carmen would go over and pick up the phone and I'd be there, <laughs> you know, about four feet away from, from where Carmen was, but we're in a, a small room and this person is manifesting at the same time so oh my um, gosh <laughs> i personally found i i used to think i just can't believe he would do that but uh, like the yeah. Italian culture and the way of doing things is very different than how we do things in the united states yes um, but that yes i would say so i mean he had a slight appearance but uh in the movie mm-hmm. you know, anthony hopkins is is father lucas who's a who's kind of a an eccentric Jesuit, and in the, in real life, yeah. uh, Father uh, Father Carmen is a Capuchin. Um, as far as the the scenes oh. where uh, you know the um, 
the exorcisms uh, took place, you know, in the in Father's house and things of that sort. They they actually looked um, fairly. Uh, they very they fairly resembled uh, what I personally, you know, experienced in the environment at the uh, the rectory at St. Lawrence outside the walls, which is in Rome. So I, I thought, you know, the they thought they were very accurate, and um, you know, things were very rustic and and rather kind of antiquated looking, and it was fairly fairly um, accurate to um, to the real life. Um, you know, uh, I don't think the environment per se had to be exact, and it wasn't. But th- there was certainly a lot of things that certainly would give you an opi- give you a feeling like you were you were really in a you were not in the United States. You really were in a Euro- in a European country, and of course. All the outside shots of the movie were shot in Rome because that's where the story takes place. But in actuality, yeah. all the inside shots took place in Budapest, Hungary, in some incredibly detailed um, sets that the uh, the movie company made and constructed wow. that I thought were very accurate uh, and very true to life. So amazing, interesting. Yeah, the process of getting these movies out there and then uh, accurately enough portraying how all of this goes about, even if they season it with elements, as long as it's not like in that movie Constantine, you know, like staring into a cat's eyes uh, or using a mirror to expel demons, you know, whenever they throw that stuff in movies, uh, you know, it just totally turns the whole thing upside down because that movie just says your goal, in addition to, you know, doing the exorcisms and, you know, healing, it was educational. Yes. In itself and inspiring. So let's hope that people watch that. Well, I was a consultant on the movie. So I was in the movie set for a week. I could have stayed longer, but I didn't initially know that. Yeah. They didn't ask me to stay longer. But after I was there about a day or two, they said, you know, can you stay longer? Well, so I stayed an extra day. But I had yeah. a parish yeah. to run. And um, Hollywood is everything is in the present moment and everything's now. And then when it's not now, they don't need you anymore. And then when it isn't now and they want to change <laughs> so the plan... They just assume that you just will do all those things, and they just couldn't. So, but um, the oh. movie was really meant to be a movie about faith, and I think they accomplished that. Uh, there are things that, that in that movie that actually did not happen to me, but I could not oh. say there was yeah. anything in that movie that could not happen. So, yeah. you know, the, uh, uh-huh. the exorcism That's what I meant, yeah. involving, involving uh, the Italian, young Italian girl, those were very accurate of what I deal with sometimes even though the critics wow. thought that was uh, totally illegitimate. They don't know what the hell they're talking about because they've never seen nope. an exorcism themselves. But those were, in nope. fact, the director kept saying to me, is this accurate, is this accurate? And I said, absolutely it's accurate. And, um, you know, because a demon can do anything it wants to a human body because it's a preternatural, intelligent being, and we're not. And so um, the notion that, you know, these, these movie, these, these moving uh, body, uh, you know, uh, body language and the, the curving of the spine and all of those things, that that was just... The kind dislocation of, yeah. kind of thing from... Uh, beg pardon? Un, the dislocation of limbs and unnatural yeah. movements can definitely yeah. happen. Yeah, that does happen, sometimes anyway, mm-hmm. but I've seen that happen, so that's why I said yes, that's very mm-hmm. accurate. It's not so crackly, like, crack, they, they almost make it sound like crunching bones, like... But it's more like they're rubber. You don't hear anything when they get into no, those I mean, positions. I've never had somebody break, have a limb broken, but yeah. uh, a demon, a demon attached to a human being, does make a body very rigid, and it the body can do and move in ways that are very unnatural, um, and it, and in fact that's what happens. And in that movie, in those those uh, scenes with that young woman Marta, she does. Yeah. Her body does move in ways that are unnatural, and that is very accurate. That's what we hope that these kind of movies will uh, portray yeah, things that I mean, are actually useful. Right. I mean, as I as I was asked, as I have been asked a number of times, you know, by various media people, do you think this the movie The Right will have the same staying power as the movie The Exorcist? And I said no. I said because it doesn't have the drama- it doesn't have the over the top. Uh, dramatic and in real life there are no green pea soups or spinning heads however when you're trying to when you're trying to express certain dramas on on a big screen you know and you're trying to convey it in a way that will keep people's attention i think that's what you know hollywood oftentimes does now the, the scene in the movie the right 
that involves the room that has all the frogs in it. That did not happen in real in reality. However, what that yeah. film was trying to convey, it was trying to convey a demonic attack, and it was very successful at that. It was meant to intimidate. It was meant to frighten. In real life, um, I do get attacked sometimes, but they're usually through thoughts of lust more than anything else. I've been physically attacked, but usually I have. I never do any of this by myself. I've always got a team of people. So, and that's to protect mm-hmm. all of us, including the petitioner who we're praying over. Um, mm-hmm. But I have been physically attacked. I've just, thank God, never been hurt. But other people who I have had with me several times have been hurt. Uh, not to the point where they have to be hospitalized, but where the, 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 de- the, the demon certainly did manhandle them. Um, but in real life, most of the attacks that come are, are internal. And so how do, you, how do you put an... And that's in the book. It's all written in the book. Right. So how do, you, yeah. how do you make an internal experience a visual external one? So... I thought, I thought it was actually very clever what they did with the frogs, even though that in and of itself didn't happen. But that's not to say that couldn't happen. Exactly. Hmm. Exorcism in a Church Militant, that was a great book, but that was a priest that uh, apparently came out later and said that the allegations were true. A young girl who was possessed seduced him. Uh, I mean, you can't blame on the young girl, of course, but um, it's... Um, I think, I think she, was, it's she was an adult. Yeah. Oh, okay. It was a, it was yeah. an adult. Okay. Right. And that's the, um, the, one of the oldest notions of an incubus, succubus rather, is uh, of tempting, uh, you know, people on their trek to holy orders, brothers, uh, priests, and uh, married men. And it, it hasn't really left. The strategies have changed, you know, I'm sure, because of the culture has changed and all that. But uh, that's something we never really get to communicate about you know men will be men women will be women and it is a huge thing to uh, you know make those kind of vows and everything like that and they're going to try to attack on Lent every year no matter what I give up it's something I got to have you know if I give up something I usually don't have that often you know like um, popcorn or something suddenly it seems so much more appealing and I think it's just because uh, you know the what to say the devil wants me to break my commitment I say a little prayer that basically commits me to that for Lent, and they want me to break it. Because other than that, if I just decide, ah, I think I'll skip popcorn today, if I hadn't said anything in a prayer, it would be no big deal. And I think it's, you know, it's, it's so much more severe uh, for people who had done a vow that actually removes themselves from any form of that on a higher level than, you know, just the temptations of single life, it's going to be more severe. And that makes you stronger, too. Well, I think Satan certainly wants to bring down anyone who's, who's in a committed relationship with Christ, either in marriage or in priesthood or religious life. And, and that is because any time uh, someone uh, falls uh, out of uh, that commitment and, and severs that promise, even though it may be temporary, um, you know, it, it, it diminishes our witness, whether we're married or we're celibate. And so in the case of Father Utnauer, uh the priest you're referring to who wrote the, um, you know, the church militant, um, he had mm-hmm. been performing exorcisms alone. That was his biggest mistake, as well as the fact that he engaged in, in a relationship involving sex with this person because he ended up being in a position of power uh, and juxtaposed to a p- person who was incredibly vulnerable. So for that reason, uh, the, the abuse of his power as priest in a role uh, of where he's dealing with a, a person who's really, um, you know, incredibly vulnerable, and then mm-hmm. you, throw, you throw in the, in, in the variable in the equation that he's doing exorcisms alone, that, that's just a card yeah. rule you can't break. You just can't. Because... It, because Satan can do a lot of things. Now, Father also had free will. However, there are things that there is power. Satan does have kinds of power that can also, you know, seduce us. So I think for everyone's yeah. safety, like I never do prayers of deliverance or um, any formal rites uh, over anyone without my prayer team there, or at least some members of my prayer team. Sometimes they're all there, and sometimes other yeah. people are there too, such as people who are other priests who are observing for the, for, who've been asked to be exorcists, been designated to be exorcists. So 
Um, it, it's a very dangerous ministry. It's very stressful. Mm. It's very complicated. It is a healing ministry. You're dealing with suffering people all the time, whether it's a mental mental health matter or it's a preternatural matter. You are, and um, you just yeah. have to be ultra careful um, because you know people are entrusting themselves to you, and you're there as really the you're the you're there as the face of the church. Um, and you're there as the delegate of the bishop because the bishop, by right of his ordination, is the chief exorcist of the local church. I'm only the exorcist because the bishop has delegated, or in this my case, mandated me uh, to function in that capacity. So it's it's a very sensitive role. It has a tremendous amount of impact and, and importance. And Satan would love nothing than to bring an exorcist down because it discredits the ministry. And it leads that many more people to think, oh, this is just a bunch of baloney, which it's not. Speaking yeah. of discrediting the ministry, um, Father Thomas, it, it seems that with the popularity um, of the last, I'd say, probably 15, 20 years of um, our obsession with uh, ghost stories, hauntings, you know, ghost boxes, detection equipment, uh, America, as well as other countries, have been very obsessed with more than just scare tactics, but with actually playing with fire, um, playing with entities. So there has been uh, a greater call for people who've realized the mistake they've made in playing with a cult to when they can't get relief from, you know, simple prayers or, you know, going to their, their service or their church, they're confused, they're scared, and they're calling upon um, a Catholic church. You know, they just pick one out of a phone book, and they're curious, you know, why doesn't the, the secretary and the priest just drop everything and say, oh, yeah, you are possessed, you've got a problem, I'll, come on over, I'll exercise you right now. Mm -hmm. And to be fair... Uh, from what I understand, and please correct me if I'm wrong, Father Thomas, the the um, basic tenements of the exorcism, you know, the old, uh, what do they call They call it two different kinds of exorcism, the minor and the major rite, have mm -hmm. not been taught in the seminary since the early 1971. So we have a bishop that has the training, but the priests, you know, they basically, there's a lot of priests that, you know, really don't, they don't know how to help people, Father. And, you know, us, we're kind of middlemen. We're middlemen in our Catholic church. We're middlemen in our ministry because we're ecumenical. How, how mm -hmm. do, you know, how can we help people, Father Thomas, in, you know, basically being ecumenical and telling them, you know, how to approach the church and how to approach their priest or bishop? Well, a, you, you bring up, a, you know, a kind of a, a well, not kind of, you bring up a very critical issue because most dioceses today do not have an exorcist. About yeah. a quarter of the dioceses in the United States, uh, maybe, pardon me, not a quarter, about a third, about a third of the dioceses in the United States have an exorcist. Many of them are now being trained through a specific school of exorcism that just started this past February. And it is under the umbrella of the United States Catholic Conference of Bishops. And um, so I, because of the movie and the book, um, it's made me a very um, public person. And because of that public disclosure, I get lots of calls and emails from all over the world. And usually from people who are very desperate or and um, either have not known what protocol to follow or when they've attempted to follow a protocol, they've had the door slammed in their face most of the time. And that's because, in general, the church in the United States, although not limited here, um, the church in the United States really has not, does not have a comprehensive plan um, no. to deal with this. Uh, when, when John Paul II issued a mandate in 2004, ordering every bishop in the world to select a priest and train them to be exorcists, some bishops took it seriously and some didn't. Mine did. Um, by doing these kinds of programs and by going around the country when I've been called upon, um, as well as when bishops or priests who have been de delegated exorcists have called me and asked me if they can either send their priest to observe or the priest calls saying, can I come? The answer is absolutely yes. Um, so I think the, the more of these kinds of programs 
uh, are put on the air. I think it does help. I think the movie, from the time the movie was made in 2011, uh, the number of exorcists have quintupled in the United States from 14 to about 80. Um, mm-hmm. I think, you know, what, what you can instruct people to do when, when they do um, have a, a need in their local church would be to either contact a local priest or contact the vicar general of their diocese. That's usually the point person. Now, the sad part is, if you have no exorcist, I have found very often when people call me, um, they've, they've gone down that path and hit a wall. And so if I know who the exorcist is, if they have one in that diocese, I will, give, I will supply the email address to them. If oh, there's wonderful. no one in that diocese, then I will try and find them someone close by who could at least mm. consult with them and direct them as appropriate. So um, it is a That's big good. problem. And even though... Um, uh, we think we've made some serious strides. We still have a long way to go. And you're right. The priests, the priests in most seminaries are the seminarians are not being taught. They're, this is not part of their mm. Yeah, I remember eight years you know, ago how difficult it was, um, and it has changed even in eight years. I think that's when the numbers went up. You just gave a number of about 80 exorcists, and I think back then there was only like uh, 25 just in all the United States. That wasn't that long ago. So I guess that's great strides so far. And no, certainly the movie did make awareness because people need visual aids. You know, and that, you have visual aids in your presentations, I think I remember. Uh, but your, the, the words you say are enough because of the authority uh, that you come with. People take the Roman Catholic Church very serious. When you have a person who's been trained in that, went to the seminary, got ordained, it, you know, uh, they have, it's because of the stereotype in part from you know, the old movie The Exorcist. Right. Uh, in the mainstream, they seem to respect the Roman Catholic exorcist as the authority on that, uh, on that topic. Well, so I think they, you I already think have your work ready. It does, because we have an authoritative ritual. That's number one. We have an authoritative mm-hmm. ritual that no other Christian church has other than the Orthodox. But our ritual goes back to 1614. And so because we have an authoritative ritual and we have we were certainly known as a church that acknowledges personified evil, um, I think that's why we tend to get more credibility. Well, I was just going to say I, I not only concur, since you know I, I did the research on the rosary and the research on the, the major rite of exorcism, that you know the authority comes from the the church having 800 years experience. And actually, they did have an order of exorcists before the rite was written. It, they just were not that organized. And I think that you know it's 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 a blessing to have that sort of history that people can come to. What is um, what is difficult to explain, Father, is um, in an ecumenical way how this method works as opposed to the 500 others they've tried of, you know, waving smelling salts, funky smelling herbs, um, dancing around candles, throwing crystals all over their property. It's, you know, you, you kind of run into, there are so many methods sprinkled out there for people to get help and this method does work. And can you help us, Father? How do you sum it up? Why this works and other methods don't? Well, because first of all, you're invoking Christ. And second of all, the, the authority of the church, which is apostolic, in that every bishop who's ordained and who's been ordained down through the ages, the, the succession can be linked back to Peter. So you have an authoritative ritual, and you have an authoritative ritual delivered by an apostolic church. And when you invoke the Lord Jesus Christ, he is the ultimate authority, as opposed to the other um, devices that you just described moments ago, none of which are yes. Christian. Mm-hmm. Very often, no. they sound very much like New Age things or pagan. And so yep. therefore, yeah. um, those things are not going to work except to invoke demons, actually. Um, so when people are using crystals or they're using other kinds of methods or sage or whatever, th- th- those practices don't have anything to do per se with, with uh, Christianity. And they're, they're, not, they're, not mm-hmm. going to have, they're not going to have the impact because they don't have the authority. Oh, the authority is huge because 
the demons recognize the authority. That's why, that's why the, the, po- yeah. the, the power of the Pope, his greatest power is his primacy. And, you know, while the church functions on a day-to-day basis in many, many ways outside of the Holy Father, it's the primacy mm-hmm. of the Pope, namely that he is the unifying, he's the Pontus Maximus. He's, he, is, he, he and the bishops together who form the teaching authority of the church, but certainly the primacy of the Pope, whereby his authority um, is the umbrella for the authority of every local church in the world. That's why when we pray one holy Catholic and apostolic, most people just say those words, but they don't really, read it. They don't really digest the impact that a unified church that has apostolic succession, that is universal in its teaching, and has the sanctification of God in it, that's what gives our church its strength, is, its, is the primacy, is, is the Holy Spirit, but coupled with that is a, a, visual, a visual unity found in the Holy Father. That's, I think, his greatest, to me, that's his greatest, uh, his greatest attribute as Pope, is, is the primacy. Because I sure love a, our Pope, too. Yeah, I love Pope he's a, Francis. He's a symbol of unity. Yeah. And when you look at other churches that have gone through, and of course ours has too, but you go through other churches where, either if they're congregational models, each church is left up to its own design, and you can go from one church to the next church, and you may not get the same teaching even about Christianity. And then in the mainline tradition where... Sometimes you've had churches that have literally parishes or, or whole bodies of believers break off because of some of the um, bifurcations that they've chosen to make about what we stand for as a church, not in terms of Catholicism, yeah. but simply in terms of Christianity. And when you do that, quite honestly, those are, those are, that's a recipe for catastrophe. When, when you start yeah. permitting um, homosexuals to, active homosexuals to serve as pastors of churches, when you ignore divorce when you um, you you are very lenient about uh, sexuality. Um, I think you you pay a price. And for all the things, when people say to me, you know, well, if the church was only if the church permitted, you know, uh, celibacy to be uh, relaxed, and if the church permitted same-sex marriage, if the church permitted uh, homosexual active homosexuals from uh, if, if they permitted them to to serve in in, in pastoral roles, you'd have more people, you know, the church would flourish. Well, honestly, the, resu- the, the reverse would actually take place. And that's why you've got so many of these mainline churches that are largely dying, because they don't stand for anything. And because they don't stand for anything, they become irrelevant. And as, Pretty as, scriptural. As, and it is scriptural. And as, as difficult as uh, Roman Catholicism has gone through not only difficult times now, but in the past... And, and certainly these are very challenging times for Roman Catholics, and a lot of people have fallen by the wayside. I think the minute we would cave to the culture of the world, the church literally would blow away. It just would. It would just blow away. It would disintegrate. So, you know, we, we have to, we're, the, we're the moral voice in the society, like it or not, we are. And when John Paul II died, um, even the media declared that he was... He was by far, he was the, the head of the Christian church in the world. And that the papacy really supersedes all other Christian denominations. And I think that's true. No, no, other, no other religious leader would have gotten the kind of coverage that John Paul II got at his funeral. Amen to that. Yeah, the Pope John Paul II brought us the uh, Chapel of Divine Mercy through Sister Faustina's recognition. And, uh, you know, that was a big thing. I don't pray to luminous mysteries of the rosary. Uh, the uh, technical aspects I think people want to dig into tonight, and uh, I want to ask one for myself, you know, and my wife, we do uh, our own healing ministry through the Roman Catholic Church. Do you find that there's a lot of educational resources out there, and I said it 10 years ago and 20 years ago, anytime you're trying to learn about this topic, for whatever reason, people out there that are laity that are novice, they come across a site that has a demonology page or wherever it is, and they seem to be obsessed with demon names. They'll have the demons' names, and they'll say, 
a tree demon. Uh, I'm not going to say names. You know the reason why. But they'll give the name and definition like it's a Wikipedia or encyclopedia of demon names. And I know to the extent uh, what the exorcist might have a use for it. And But I'd like you to tell our listening audience, when would demon names come in handy to have a reference or a knowledge of what demon names associated with this or that, even known in demon names at all? Could you get completely through the exorcism without even knowing the actual demons' names? It's like, much, say, if you difficult. can't even remember the ones in the Bible? It's much more difficult to, and I'll tell you why. Because in the, in the ritual itself, it calls, for, it calls for calling forth the name of the demon. And so in, in our tradition, and this is not true in other Christian traditions, that uh, the evangelicals... Mm-hmm. And, Pentecostals, I don't think for them it matters if they get the name or not. In our tradition, it is. And it is because in the same way that at baptism, the first question that is asked of a set of parents who are baptizing their infant, or if a person is old enough to speak for themselves, the first question that is asked of them at the rite of baptism is, what is your name? And that's a parallel with when the patriarchs, pardon me, when the prophets were called by name, by God, mm-hmm. and they were called by name. Mm-hmm. And Jesus called the disciples by name. So the notion of being called by name is biblical, and it is a way of calling the person into the realm of the light. In the same way, the demons do not want to be called into the realm of the light because they, they flourish in the realm of darkness and defeat. So therefore, the naming mm-hmm. is huge in our tradition because it's actually in the ritual itself, but that's why. Now, as far as knowing the name and the importance of the name, where that comes in handy is very often yeah. uh, the, demon is, the demon's name is not a biblical name. There's a, I can't remember the exact number of biblical names, but there's a whole set in the, you Google, you Google the, uh, satanic names, and there's, I don't know, 100 or so. But very yeah. often, in my personal experience, when, you, when the demon tells you its name, it's a name you've never heard of before. So when you go to your iPad, and I don't have one, but my team does, they'll be yeah. looking up this name in Wikipedia, and they will find that this is the name of an Aztec god, or a Mayan god, or some other pagan system. And that can be very helpful because it provides us with a source of, okay, who put the curse... Who, who put the curse on this person? What happened that either we know about or we've not yet learned about of who, how this demon might have entered into the person? So that's, knowing the origin of, the, of where the, how the demon got in is huge. You need that. But also, very, very often, when you find out that the, the etiology of the name, when you're able to determine that, it can go a long way in helping you understand, okay, the person who was involved, either the, per- the petitioner or some other person, if it's involving a curse or a hex or something, mm-hmm. it may give you mm-hmm. insight into what that person did in order to invoke the demon to come in the first place. So it is helpful. Wow. That's great. That's, um, that's a lot of detail right there, and... Uh, I appreciate the answer on that thing. I noticed that, uh, you know, the personal, the thing of the personal name, too, sometimes when the infestation is beginning and it's moving to oppression, um, and not necessarily at that stage, a person will be lying in bed, and right before they drift to sleep, they'll hear a voice in their left ear, typically, say their name, just the first name. And for some reason, you know, that type of communication, calling them by their name, you know, is relevant, and it's a demonic spirit, as it turns out, and it's it's quite common. Some people are not really sure, you know, why is that, but I think your answer actually fits that, too, that it's quite personal, just as in baptism, as when you call it out by name. But I think the thing I, I'd like to note is the exorcist, with his authority of the Roman Catholic Church and the ritual, the methods used in the ritual will provoke the demon to reveal his numbers and their true names, and you know, and maybe more than one, because uh, how many times do they just make fun of you and say, I'm the devil, or do they say a name, that, it's like you said, they say names that you never heard of before, right. and um, I, I don't know if you recall, I think St. Sebastian said there was something like uh, an estimated four billion or so demons, that would be one thick phone book hmm. to look up. I just know, according to the book of Revelation, a third of the angels fell away from, 
from the realm of God. So I don't know. We don't know. Yeah. How that. So I think that people sometimes are satisfied when they hear a demon name come out as a possessed and uh, they're not, they don't test the spirit further. Right. Or if they get numbers, you know, and um, well, the sacra- the sacramentals and everything can be such a hot foot in a way, almost a means of torture for the spirit to reveal itself. Then they don't have a reference. It's like, okay, we have a name, but where are we going to look it up? Well, we have the internet now, and right. if you can, I don't know yeah, that it, it yeah, because it might have come up before. In the, matter, in the matter of minutes, we will find out that the name is very legitimate. We've never heard of it before, but we'll find out. Oh, there is such a there is such a a Mayan god or an Aztec god or or mm-hmm. or a Hindu god. I mean, I you'd be amazed how many of these these entities have names that are not biblical, but they're yeah. from other places. And sometimes what has invoked them has been the use of uh, pagan rituals and satanic rituals uh, uh, mm. to, to in which Satan assigns, you know. Mm-hmm. Certain, certain what about hereditary? Their relatives well, that, could have been uh, yeah, way I mean, back there, there's, there's, there's blood. There's blood. Mm. There's issues having to do generational curses. Uh, there yeah. can be gen- there can be generational ties. Uh, that's you know that's I deal with that sometimes. So you know you ask all those kinds of questions in a discernment, and then even when you ask it in the initial discernment, very often there's things you haven't asked that over the course of time, when you're praying with the person, you'll start one thing will trigger another question. So you know uh, it's certainly it's, it's a question that it's certainly in the in the basic discernment of you know. Is, Tell me about your tell me about your family line. Tell me about your family tree. Uh, has you know have there been instances of, of you know demonic oppression or obsession or other kinds of satanic activity you know in other family members? And uh, you know to your knowledge uh, has there been any kind of curse that's been passed down? Sometimes the demons will tell you that, but sometimes wow. the family can also tell you that depending on how much they know. A lot of times they can't, but there yeah. are times when they will disclose things that they have just known, you know, from one generation to the next. It's not always the case, but it is at times. I had the benefit of reading a lot of the, uh, you know, the transcripts uh, that they accompanied from the recordings. I didn't get to listen to those. It's amazing how many times some historical names have come up, you know, and, uh, you know, such as Judas. And it, it apparently in a document, it, they seem to give it relevance, so we're to assume that Judas is now a minion of the devils. Uh, but sometimes we can't go by that all the way. But I'm just going by the track record of the church and the success of drawing names. I don't want to stay too long in this uh, topic because I wanted to throw in there um, about new names that are out there, and they're sort of nicknames, and that's the Slender Man. It's being treated as a demon. A couple of 12-year-old girls try to do a ritual murder in the woods. And I see the picture, the rendition, and I told my wife that I've seen that one before. The one that looks like it has a white face and a black suit, long arms. I didn't see six tentacles. But I know that sometimes they can take any character. It's like idolatry. You can take a head of lettuce. You can start worshiping it, and then there'll be a demon dispatch. They'll try to see that you stay on that superstitious course. Maybe you're going to try to affect miracles that keep you away from the path of God. But if this is just a character or cartoon drawing, I thought that was kind of unusual that I actually seen something that looked just like that, apart from the six tentacles in the back of it. I was just wondering what your thought was on that type of thing. Well, I'm not really sure what to make of it. I mean, I don't know if demons can change their names once they have a name. It's kind of like, you know, human beings can change their names um, and occasionally do. I don't honestly know the answer to the question. I do know that I have, uh, I knew, do know people who have seen entities that um, somewhat describe what you're saying. Uh, there's um, there's uh, someone who's described for me what they call the top hat man. And um, yeah. that has, I, I know of several people who are, who, have gifted, who are gifted, who have told me that they've seen uh, what appears to be what they call the top hat man, um, sometimes in cemeteries or in other places. But I've never, I don't, I don't have that. So, you know, you don't ever see the demons. You see the manifestations of the demons because they're pure spirits. But I do know, I do know people who, who can see the spirits. Yeah, and they do that. There's a lot of classifications that are more like our mortal 
descriptions of them. You know, uh, there's Hat Man, yeah, you know, and if it looks like a flying black sheep, yeah. you know, they'll call it right. a wraith. Right. You know, if it's a hooded specter, they'll call it as right. such. If, if it looks right. like a person, right. they'll call it a shadow person. You know, so yeah, I think that gets kind of carried away too.